Hello, today I'm going to be talking about mistakes that I commonly see or give advice on. And I've concentrated on mistakes which have simple remedies and things that you can fix in your own anesthetic practice. And this is very much aimed at beginner anesthetists or anesthetists that are occasional anesthetists. Uh, maybe generalists that are doing other work and occasionally do an anesthetic. Um, and I'm going to focus on those things which you should really get right in the first few months of your anesthetics. Now, anesthetics can be challenging and mistakes are inevitable. I've made more than my share, but many are preventable. So the focus today is those common mistakes that are easily preventable. The key in anesthetics is to reduce the cognitive load, the thinking load. You need to reduce the number of things that can go wrong and you need to have already planned for them when they do go wrong. So in essence, you're controlling the controllables. And a lot of that is about preparation. I like this quote, the first time that you do something, it's a mistake. The second time it's a choice and the third time it's a habit. And if your mistakes are due to lack of preparation, then this quote rings true. And I think we can fix a lot of that. So instead of calling these mistakes, I'm going to call them areas to work on just to be less negative. And the first one is that we fail to prepare. And I want you to think about your normal anesthetic. What do you do before every single anesthetic you give? Are there routines you go through to minimize the chance of problems? And how much attention do you pay to the anesthetic machine honestly? That machine should be checked, much like you'd want the pilot to check an airplane you're on. Now, I don't expect a full machine check between every patient. I don't believe any anesthetist uh, should do that. It should be checked daily at the beginning uh, of, of busy theater slates. But in district hospitals, I don't know that this happens every day. Between every case, though, there is a check that I do. Every single time before I give a, an anesthetic, I check these things about my anesthetic machine. And you must at least do what I'm about to suggest, I think, in every single case. The first thing that I look at is, is my machine on? And that's quite easy to see. You can see the, the power uh, light is on. But importantly, just have a look over there and make sure that it's your AC power. So it's your mains power and not the battery power that you're running on. If you're running on battery power, sometimes the power cable is just pulled out the back of the machine. Or in South Africa, uh, maybe there's load shedding. And it's worth looking because you don't want to start an anesthetic um, if you're on battery power. So always check that I'm on, on mains. Then this check, excuse the quality of the photo, but you can see that the person in this photo is holding her left hand uh, on the end of the circuit. So she's occluding the circuit and then she's going to squeeze the bag and generate pressure. And she's trying to see if she can generate pressure. Now this check I do every single time before I put the mask on the patient. And the reason is, that's the, the hand occluding the, um, the end. <coughs> the reason is that if you can generate pressure, you must have gas flowing. You must have a circuit on the machine. And I have personally given them an anesthetic and then looked back to find that there wasn't even a circuit on my machine. It's a thing that you can forget unless you check it. While if you've got get gas going and you're able to generate a pressure, there's no massive leak. One of the bits of the circuit isn't off. You don't have a massive hole in the bag. So the bag must be functional. And so you've checked that if you're in trouble, you're going to be able to ventilate the patient. You're going to be able to generate pressure. It also tells me that you know how to use manual or spontaneous on your anesthetic machine, which is a thing that you don't want to be figuring out in a crisis. And it tells me that you're able to close an APL valve, which stands for adjustable pressure leak. Now, all of those things, if you can do all of those things and you've got a functional circuit, should you need to ventilate the patient with a bag, your machine is going to be able to do that. And I do the simple check every single time I give an anesthetic, especially if it's not a general anesthetic, if it's a spinal anesthetic. Because the problem with a spinal anesthetic is that you need to convert to general anesthesia. And the one time that I had a um, no circuit on my machine, it was because I did a spinal anesthetic and I didn't think I'd be needing the machine. So do this every single time. Just to clarify about the APL valve, that's uh, that's two versions. Those are both on um, Drager machines. The one on the left with the person's hand on it is the more modern type. 
and you can see that's dialed to 30. That is 30 centimeters of water pressure, so that's quite a high pressure. And when you test a machine, you often ask to, to set the APL valve to 30. It wants a standardized pressure. The problem is that when you then give the anesthetic and you're pre-oxygenating the, the patient, people often forget to put this to naught. So if the patient is breathing spontaneously, that APL valve should be naught up to about five if you're trying to give a little bit of uh, peep, but you need to turn that thing off 30. And I often find first case of the day after everyone's checked their machines, people are pre-oxygenating patients with this amount of pressure, which is very uncomfortable for the patient. The other APL valve is the slightly older type. We have to dial it up and down. Again, you want to know exactly where that pressure is sitting. And you'll notice on that machine, there isn't an anesthetic circuit. So check this before you start every single time. What is my APL valve on? And that's the basic machine check I do in every single patient. I also do a full one at the start of the day's play. Uh, if you aren't familiar with it, get yourself a checklist. This is what pilots do. So complex machinery needs checking, and you'd want your, um, your pilot to check their machine. Your patient wants you to check your anesthetic machine. And if you're looking for a, 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 a reminder of how to do that, uh, this is called this is a video called the Anesthetic Machine Check. It's given by Garth Horston, who's a specialist anesthetist. Um, it's 12 minutes long, and he'll take you through what's required for the diploma of anesthetic machine check. And it's on the YouTube channel. If you just look for it, it's in there. Um, and it's an excellent way to revise. Do this every now and again, because you'll be surprised at some of the checks that you do, and you'll pick up other errors. But I don't expect everyone to be at this level. You need at least to be able to generate pressure with your circuit and your, uh, your bag. Now, area number two is that we don't examine our patients properly. Now, I know that you know that you should examine all of your patients. I also know that we anesthetize and operate on patients who haven't been examined. We assume it's been done and you're in a rush, and, but sometimes everyone makes the assumption that someone else has examined the patient and no one has. Now, I could tell you that you need to do a top to toe. That is the way that you should do it. But in every single patient, you need to have active thoughts on two areas, your fluid assessment and the heart rate in every patient every single time. Now, the first about uh, when we talk about fluids, hypovolemia and anesthesia don't mix well. If you put a spinal anesthetic into a hypovolemic patient, the blood pressure is going to fall catastrophically. If you give a normal dose of induction agent in a general anesthesia, but the patient is hypovolemic, the same is going to happen. That blood pressure is going to drop precipitously. So you have to diagnose and fix hypovolemia before you start. If the patient's actively bleeding and you know the patient's hypovolemic but you have to continue, then you give much less anesthetic, but there's more on this later. So you need to diagnose hypovolemia. <coughs> so every patient gets this assessment. How do you do it? Well, you take a history. Is the patient thirsty? Thirsty patients, uh, they're telling you something. You should do a clinical examination. What's the heart rate? What are the mucous membranes? What's the capillary refill time? You know how to do this. If, you, if you're a little bit more advanced, you can do straight leg raises. Um, but this is a clinical assessment in addition to the history. And finally, consider the pathology. Are you expecting this patient to be behind in fluids? Is it a cesarean section and the patient hasn't been able to eat for 12 hours or drink? Is the patient septic? Is the patient bleeding? All of these things that make you dehydrated, potentially hypovolemic. And if you're not sure and you're a beginner, give the fluid. So if you're not sure, just give them a bolus. Rather be a little bit over than a little bit behind. The second area that you must look at is the heart rate. And obviously the heart rate might suggest that you're behind in fluids. But it also has other causes. And your answer to the heart rate question must influence the technique you choose and the action you take. So the principle here is that high heart rates must be respected. You must have a theory as to why that heart rate is high. Now, if the blood pressure is also high and the heart rate's high, there's lots of simple explanations for that that are not so worrying. So anxiety, pain, that sort of thing, sympathetic drive. So high blood pressures and high heart rates are less worrying than low normal blood pressures 
in the presence of a high heart rate because then the patient's compensating for some process or the, the heart rate is a response to sepsis or bleeding or hypovolemia and those patients you need to worry about. So um, there is a, an index called the shock index which is mainly used in trauma patients but it's finding applications uh, elsewhere which is simply the heart rate divided by the systolic blood pressure um, and then there's all sorts of values that are used to indicate what's the likely uh, prognosis but what I suggest is that you just look at whether the heart rate is higher than the systolic blood pressure and every time you see the heart rate higher than the systolic blood pressure you must think is it fluids that I must give must I give less anesthetic why is this happening and nothing is static in anesthesia nothing ever it's always changing so something has happened that's made the heart rate get higher than the systolic blood pressure and you need to respond to that which brings me to area number three that we fail to titrate the anesthetic we give one recipe now if you've got one recipe for every problem or for every patient then you have a problem um, and that's something we need to fix outside of perhaps rigid ketamine recipes uh, most anesthetics require certainly general anesthetics require you changing the doses depending on the stimulus and the patient's response and how well the patient and so you need to adjust your anesthetic old patients well they need less drug to go to sleep they need less drug to keep them asleep and it takes longer for them to work because of the lower cardiac output so if you give your first dose to put the patient to sleep and it's not working and you give the next dose by the time they both kick in that might cause a cardiac arrest and really early in my career I did this too by giving a normal dose to an elderly patient the patient ended up fine but it's because I didn't adjust my dose to the age of the patient so you need to consider the age younger patients might need much more and and quite often the dose you give um, is is half the dose you need so you need to adjust your doses to age sick patients might need much less I often say if they're quite sick you give half your induction agents if they're very <coughs> if they're very sick you give a quarter and if they're critically ill maybe you just wave the amp under the nose they need tiny amounts of drug to keep them asleep and to put them asleep and if you give them the full dose it can cause cardiovascular collapse so adjust your dosing to the condition of the patient remember also that the condition of the patient is changing with the surgery so that when there's a lot of stimulus and a lot of surgical pain you will need to go up on your anesthetic and up on your analgesia when the blood pressure drops you must think about what the cause of that so when the blood pressure and the heart rate change there needs to be a, con a, a corresponding change in the amount of anesthetic and analgesia you're giving higher blood pressures maybe more analgesia more anesthetic low blood pressures give less anesthetic low blood pressures might need more fluid more blood maybe you need to give a vasopressor if the blood pressures are up and down your chart needs to look busy with all the responses that you're taking there's no single dose that should work for the whole anesthetic you are going to be changing these things all the time and it's not a sin to have what we call an alpine anesthetic where the blood pressure is up and down but it is to not respond to that so you must titrate the anesthetic and if we're talking about common anesthetic errors it's that when something goes wrong there's anaphylaxis or there's bleeding or the patient becomes unstable often the beginner anesthetist forgets to dial back the gas and I often the first thing I do is I just turn it off completely and I allow the patient to get lighter and that will stop that depression of the blood pressure and the, and the cardiac output area number four <clears throat> is that you must respect the extubation period now extubation the complications are underestimated we all worry about the intubation the complication rate at intubation for anesthetists is 4%. The complication rate at extubation is 12%. It's three times as high in the hands of experienced anesthetists in well resourced settings where the staff are in the room at both times. So it is a higher risk time. And yet, when I intubate, I feel like the theater looks like this people everywhere, everyone watching, everyone nervous. And when you extubate, it feels like this. 
you find yourself all alone in the room extubating. So don't be alone. Have, make sure the people that you need are in the room when you pull the tube. Now there are actually extubation guidelines. If you go and look up the Difficult Airway Society guideline, this is a free, uh, a free download, this algorithm. One of the points they make is that you must plan the extubation at the beginning of the anesthetic. And they're all, there's a whole bunch of risk factors, airway risk factors and patient risk factors and things that happen during the surgery. And then you go into low and high risk parts of that algorithm. It's worth having a look at if you're interested. What I would suggest in the district hospital for the beginner is that everyone gets an awake extubation. So just take deep extubations off the table. And by awake, I mean really awake. They're looking at you, they're nodding and answering questions, they're trying to grab the tube with their own hands. One of the key mistakes we make is that you think the patient's awake and you pull it before they actually are, and then they get laryngospasm and all those respiratory complications. The second thing is that there are routine extubation criteria. They must be breathing at least 15 mils per kilogram, so getting a nice tidal volume when they when they take a deep deep breath in. I like to just see that they're at least moving their tidal volumes of six moles per kilogram. They aren't hypoxic or hypercarbic or very acidotic. They're not hemodynamically unstable and their muscles are working. So if you gave a muscle relaxant, you've reversed it. Then you pre-oxygenate, so get a lot of oxygen into these patients, anywhere between 80 to 100 percent oxygen. Uh, some people like to leave a little bit of nitrogen in to splint the, the lungs, so I tend to use something like 90% oxygen and 10% air. Suction them while they're asleep, get all that muck out of the back of their lungs. Position them, so if you're able to, put the bed slightly head up, so ramp them up again. Um, so, so 15 to 20 degrees up, this helps the lungs helps the functional residual capacity, it opens the airway. So uh, just as you put patients to sleep, put, uh, wake them up in the same way with the, the bed tilted up. And then get your technique right. And, and by technique, if you think about when you extubate a patient, how do you pull the tube out? And if I were to ask you what phase of respiration should they be in, is that something that you watch? And the answer is that the, the lungs must be full of air. So it's at end inspiration. So the right way to do it is to fill the lungs with air. Either the patient takes a deep breath and holds it, or you squeeze the bag to help them and you get that full. They hold it at inspiration and you deflate the cuff and extubate while the lungs are full. And the reason for that is then if there's muck that's hanging around once the tube's out, the patient's able to generate a cough at that point and expel those things rather than suck them in, which is what they'll have to do if the lungs are empty. And there's also less chance of laryngospasm by a complicated meth method, but it's very important the way you extubate. So if you haven't thought about that technique, it's something that you should do. And then finally, and this is a quick one, the last area that I think we, we neglect a little bit is we forget to value the recovery period. Now, this is the sort of thing you, you're taking your patients to. <clears throat> Don't rush it. I know we, we're pleased that we finished the surgery and it's all done. We want to get them back to the ward so we can get on with other things but you must use this period. So put that in a monitored setting like this, often for the last time, for a long time. So put them in the setting and take a pause. Clean your theater, make your notes beautiful, just give the patient long enough and have an appropriate pause. And then look at the patient when you sign the patient out. Check they're not complicating. Look at the numbers, heart rate, systolic blood pressure, respiratory rate. Uh, look at if the heart rate is higher than the systolic blood pressure again. If that heart rate is higher than the systolic blood pressure, is it something you can treat? Pain, anxiety, or is it telling you that this patient's still not physiologically well? And if you're worried and, and you're forced to sign the patient out, schedule a visit in the post-operative phase. If things are gonna go wrong, it's often in the last, <coughs> in the first four to six hours after discharge from the recovery. So schedule a visit, set an alarm on your watch and go and see the patient because often uh, when you get there they'll, they'll either deteriorate it or stabilize because they've had that bit of time but don't neglect the patient till the next day so use that recovery patient uh, period to get a good feel for your patient and make an appropriate plan for your patient so that's five common mistakes that we make in anesthesia and I think all of them are easily fixable and will really make, if you, if you adopt the simple suggestions that I've made, I think they can make your anesthetic journey uh, a lot smoother. Thank you.